You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is June 3rd, 2011, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, Molecular Biology of Allergens, Part 1. Our presenter is Dr. Brock Williams. He's affiliated with the section of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology at Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics. be joined this morning by Dr. Uh, Brock Williams. Uh, Dr. Williams has been uh, one of the instrumental characters or uh, people in the characterization of antibody assays, uh, particularly assays for IgE and IgG and specific antibodies. And more recently, he's been doing a great deal of, uh, of research into the nature of specific molecules that are associated with allergies. And uh, Brock assures me that so it seems incredibly complex with all of the component testing and the and the uh, the recombinant allergens that are coming out. That at some point a breakthrough will occur, and out of complexity will come simplicity. And that's that's really when an understanding finally takes place. When you understand how it how things work so well that you can simplify them into a unified model. So um, with that as an introduction, I'm going to turn the podium over to Dr. Brock Williams. Uh, let me just make you the presenter. Mm -hmm. And if you click on the show my screen button, we'll be able to see your screen. Okay, where is it? Should be uh, right here. Got it. Okay. Okay, now you have to close that window. You're there. You couldn't get any further. And there you go. Now just. <laughs> there you go. So take it away, Dr. Williams. Okay, well, thank you, Jay. And and this is just a wonderful uh, um, media for exchanging ideas, and, and you've really done a great job in uh, getting this all together and promoting it. Uh, what I'd like to do is uh, I have two sessions with everyone, and, and this first one is sort of general considerations of how we got to where we are, sort of the history of it, because I don't think many allergists are actually familiar with the uh, with what's been going on in the background for the last 20 years. Um, this will be a little bit scattered because Paul kind of pushed me to update this, uh, to, to do this session a week or two early, so it's all Paul's fault if uh, okay. that happens. <laughs> I will be uh, purposely redundant in a lot of this, and, and I think it's, it's actually a reflection of what we're seeing now and understanding with respect to allergens that there's a heck of a lot of redundancy and uh, cross-reactivity, etc. Uh, I kind of start with a little quote that I really like from Winnie the Pooh that uh, there's an increasing number of things that I know less about. And I think allergists are really in this boat. Uh, it's kind of like going to a play uh, and you get there late and then you uh, someone reviews what, the, what has transpired and by the time they reviewed it, the plot has gone further on, and so you need another review. And I hope to uh, kind of bridge that hiatus a little bit in, uh, uh, in these two lectures. I have uh, nothing to disclose, uh, uh, no grants, no fees, uh, but I have over the years uh, worked with the Pharmacia and Fadia scientists and consider them uh, uh, top-notch and um, I think uh, uh, it's been a privilege to work with them. Um, are you showing just by screen, or is that little thing up there, uh, Jay? I just see your screen. Okay, that's cool. Okay, ah, I can't get it forward. Huh? There we go. Okay, I got a couple of little CME questions for everyone, and. Uh, First one is uh, when summing the specific IG from a large number of tests, say 99 specific IG tests, uh, what would you expect the percent of the specific IG over the total IG to be? And these are the following categories. Second one is what percent of protein families contain allergens? This is the universe of all the proteins that we know everything about. Okay, uh, 
Common properties of allergens include the following, except heat stability, stable to digestion, tend to form polymers, infrequent in nature, are involved in protection. And common functions of allergens include the following, except proteases, protease inhibitors, lipid transport, receptors, calcium modulators. Okay. You should be able to answer those pretty easy. They're kind of simple ones, but, you know. Okay. Uh, we know that uh, allergies uh, have been around for a long time. Uh, it's an ancient problem, and it continues. We, we know the story about uh, minis, the feral that got stung with a, a wasp in England, and that changed history because he would have had, uh, he, he would have got tin, and his swords would have been a lot stronger than just just copper. He would have had brass. Uh, we we kind of think today of uh, that that uh, genetic predispositions important in allergy, and, uh, and we, we really know that exposure variables uh, variables are very important. I kind of think this genetic predispositions overplayed uh, because once we look at the structure and function of allergens, there's no reason why everyone ought to be sensitized to these. And and so that pushes us back into the exposure board, <coughs> goes on to the system uh, to determine whether they're going to make IgE or not. We do know that the mucosal is a survival niche for IgE and that uh, uh, producing cells, like 15% in an atopic individual are dedicated to uh, making IgE versus 1% or less than 1% in, in normal individuals. We also know that it's important to think about IgE presentation and targeting, and that IgE can actually present uh, allergens uh, once you have some IgE, you present it. And when you do that, you actually present the molecule and make uh, IgE to other epitopes, and we call that targeting. And bystander effects are kind of important. Once you've created the milieu for making IgE, mainly in mucosal tissues, that uh, that anything else that comes in there along with it is actually uh, 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 susceptible to, uh, or is actually enhanced IgE synthesis to it. This creates a lot of confusion with IgE tests, by the way, and we'll, we'll see some of that. Uh, theories about uh, IgE, the innate immune system driven, and could be related to autoimmunity, but maybe it's the allergens themselves, and, and uh, we'll talk about these things in a minute. Okay, what's in an allergen extract? This is grass, and you can see on the left-hand side that uh, an SDA separation gives you a number of bands, but when you uh, separate in the second dimension with isoelectric focusing, you see all these different proteins. And the question is, which are relevant? And uh, and the, the problem is, that this is, a, you know, extracts are fairly complex, and, and what are the chances you have the appropriate allergen in them? Uh, we, we really don't know these things. We don't know about stability of a lot of them, and we don't know about quantity. So that that's, creates a lot of problems. Okay, when we started looking at allergens, this has been going on for quite a few years now. You know, aqueous, uh, aqueous extracts are, are made, and, and they haven't really significantly changed since 1923 with the uh, advent of uh, cocos glycerin solution. Uh, they're all defatted, which is kind of significant because uh, we'll see that several of these allergens are probably not very well represented in allergen extracts, uh, those for in vitro and those for skin testing, because they're not, uh, because they're taken out with the, uh, with the fatty, uh, uh, with the fat. Uh, the very important allergens uh, in this class. Uh, we separate proteins by molecular weight by page, and proteins have been banded. Uh, protein bands are alluded to nitrocellulose, and these are uh, uh, these are identified with with sera containing Ig antibodies. And here's a picture. This is true for almost every single allergen extract. Whereas you do the the separation by size, and you immunoblot sera from patients who have IgE antibodies, and this is what you get. Well, this is a real mess. Uh, there are uh, there's IgE to a lot of different molecules here, and uh, I'll 
say a few comments about this, and I'll show this slide again. But the main thing is, look at uh, all the people are all the patients are different. So why do we get these multiple bands? Well, it, it, sometimes when you make extracts, things get fragmented, and uh, and that could be, but it, it, it's uh, it could be contributing to the multiple bands. Uh, the bystander milieu uh, effect could really be taking place here because you, once you're sensitized to one allergen, have an allergic reaction to something that's in that extract, and then are exposed to it again, you you make antibodies to the stuff that's around there. And the targeting could also be uh, uh, a problem here for the same reasons. Uh, this could be cross-reactions from other sensitizations. Uh, and we'll see a lot of that in, in especially the second talk. Uh, an important question, again, is which are relevant to the symptoms. Now, uh, everyone's seen this approach to trying to understand why Ig antibody concentrations, uh, as they increase, we see the probability of symptoms also increase. But if you look at the immunoblot that I showed you, you see that that actually, when you're measuring IgE, um, you don't get smooth curves like this. You get th th this is a con th these curves that are shown are really a consequence of many different curves, of many different IgEs to single proteins, and this is kind of combined. And the chances are that when you get up to higher levels of IgE, you're making IgE to the relevant uh, protein. Uh, so, so that's why we see this curve. So it's a little different interpretation of this. Okay, back to this uh, uh, allergram, uh, allergogram is what they call it, and all these different patients in their IgE. And you can see, for example, here's an allergen uh, which is uh, present not here and probably not here, but in all the rest of them. This is a band that, that lights up. So. You might have a positive IgE in this patient, but he may not have any symptoms because he doesn't have IgE to a relevant protein. And you can also see people who have really a lot of IgE, for example, band 10, and, and of course they include relevant allergens and everything else. So this guy's really got a, a high IgE, a, a, a immunocap level, and um, and this guy over here has a pretty low one, but they both have Ig, the relevant allergen, and therefore they both have symptoms. But a very different amount of Ge, so that's that's a real problem in interpretation of these things. So the total specific Ige doesn't necessarily match the degree of sensitivity. Exactly, exactly, and we'll see why that it becomes very clear. And the International Union of Immunological Societies decided to start labeling these allergens, and I think we're all familiar with it. A major allergen is one which over 50% of the people are sensitized, a minor allergen is less than 50%. And we name these things with the first three letters of the genus, the first letter of the species name, and uh, Arabic numbers uh, indicating the order of uh, discovery. So we, like for cat, it's Feldy 1, mite. Teramismus is D, Teramismus 1, and peanut, air H2, etc. There's some problems with this, and the, the, this is just, this just names things in order that, that, that they were discovered. It, doesn't ident it only identifies a source, it makes no relationship to structure or function, and, and it, it, it actually really makes it difficult. I have a heck of a time remembering these things. And, and we know that CANF2 from DOG and FELD1 are highly cross-reactive, but why aren't they both FELD2 or, you know, this sort of thing. So it's, it creates a lot of confusion, but a wonderful database to consult, and it's free. It's on the Internet, the Allergome, which is created by uh, Andriano Mary, and it's updated almost instantly with references, and, and it would be a good place to go if you want to understand more about these uh, the, the allergens. Um, this is an older slide, but I just want to point out that, that we've really made a lot of progress in understanding uh, and defining these allergens. And we have, uh, in, night, in 2009, we had uh, partial or entire sequences or a thousand different allergens. And, 
Uh, they were immunochemically defined, and we've cloned over 600. That, that number is probably closer to 1,000 now. So we've cloned them. We know what they look like. We know their structures, and now we'll get into some of that. Now, historically, we always thought any, any protein could become an allergen. I mean, any protein seems to be, you know, they, they all can be made immunogenic. And so we have to ask this question. And the answer is uh, no. And here's why. Uh, a recent study, this is 2007, was published in Jackie. It's a huge study. Uh, it's a thousand, over a thousand multi-sensitized patients. Their, their, their specific IG was analyzed to 89 different allergens. That's greater than nine, or it's close to 90,000 determinations. And when they, they did a cluster analysis, and they found that the reactivities could be clustered mainly into 12 clusters, 12 related uh, factors in, uh, in the sera could define almost all their sensitizations. Well, that's a clue that, that actually um, that much of the IG produced is, is to specific cross-reacting structures with, with, uh, with different sources and that these groups are limited to a relatively small number of structures. So there really aren't that many different uh, proteins that can, can be um, allergens. This recent study uh, uh, is, is really a cutie. Uh, this is uh, another study similar to the last one where they, they looked at 99 allergens and 5,000 plus sera and a heck of a lot of tests. And here they, they say, well, you know, if we run that many tests, we ought this the specific E ought to equal the totally. You know, I mean, you add it all up. And it turns out that, no, the cumulative IG, specific IG values never got more than 20 to 30 percent of the total E. Hmm. So what the heck's the rest of this E doing? Well, we'll get to that here. Uh, as you increase the total E in the patients, uh, they get more positive tests. In fact, up to 85 percent of the tests at, at 3,200 inter units, uh, international units were positive. They looked at this from a motive point of view. A motive is uh, an identified sequence, uh, say 50 amino acids, which is common among uh, different proteins, and found that, that different extracts uh, average to have at least three different motives, and some of them up to 14 which is like dust mite has about 14 of these allergenic motives. And so if they look at this uh, from the percent of the S, uh, specific IG motives, motives uh, over the total E, then, then since there's three per extract, then you divide this 20 to 30 percent by three, and so the, the specific IG of the total is probably less than 10 percent. Okay. Uh, and if you look in, in the, all these allergens and all these patients and see if how many of them have one single, um, identify one single motive, very few, 1.6 percent of them, and that's probably because we, can, we don't know all the motives that are <coughs> identifiable. So again, there's a very high amount of cross-reactivity among all these allergens, and, uh, uh, and, and that's why uh, you can you can get more positive tests as you increase the total IgE, but you never make more specific I, more specific IgE than 10 percent of the total. So uh, this is this is telling us essentially that patients are sensitized to only a small number of cross-reactive structures, and then, and so then well, let's look at what those structures are. And these are some of the, the big steps in the field that we've, we've cloned many of these allergens and expressed them. We know their sequences and we can line them up with each other and compare them. We know their three-dimensional three structure. We, we know that their domains and like these motifs, uh, 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 we, uh, we can, we can uh, engineer these things. We've defined a lot of their functions. We've studied them immunologically and now we have all these huge databases with all this information in it, and you're recommended to go to any of these on the internet. The PFAM database, I'd really recommend to 
clinicians. It's it's really uh, uh, very simple and it describes the proteins and the different families. Uh, and there there are other structural databases that you can also consult. But it's sort of a uh, generated a connubial relationship between genomics, proteomics, and bioinformatics, and that's. The, that's where I got most of my information. I get it today. As an example, you've seen these little ribbon diagrams of, of uh, different proteins, and this is a, a pathogenesis-related five protein that seems to be a pretty important allergen, the thomatin. It's also ten thousand times sweeter than sugar, uh, and uh, uh, Europeans use it as a sweetener, uh, and it's uh, it's a very potent allergen. We don't use it yet. <laughs> okay, what about all these proteins? If you if you combine proteins uh, from the uh, protein family and the structural uh, databases, and you get this all fam database, we know that there are about eleven thousand, twelve thousand protein families in the universe of all the proteins on Earth. Uh, and we look in there and see how many of those are allergenic. And it turns out that they're confined to about 236 protein families, which is only 2% of all the total possible proteins that you could be allergic to. And many of these families contain multiple allergenic proteins, which are called homologs or orthologs. They're, they're very similar to each other. Thus, allergens comprise a small fraction of all the protein families with particular biological functions and structures, and we, we'll get into that. But but it says that not just anything can become an allergen, and there's really not too many proteins that do. Uh, another way of looking at this, uh, in, in some of these databases, we can we can look at 434 plant allergens are are in 70 different protein families. 359 animal allergens are in 76 protein families, and 136 fungal allergens in 61 protein families. These numbers will change a little bit, but uh, the relevance is in the top 20 allergen protein families, you can account for 80% <coughs> of all the plant allergens, 73% of all the animal ones, and 64% of the allergens from fungi. So what are the properties of these allergens? Well, they're, they're mostly, uh, they're, uh, most of them, not all of them, are, are very stable to processing uh, enzymes and uh, heat and this sort of thing uh, and digestion. They're tough little proteins, and it's mainly because they have these multiple cysteine linkages, and they, they don't unfold very easily. They're very pervasive. They're everywhere in nature. They tend to form aggregates and polymers uh, with themselves. Many of these are defense-related. These are proteins which organisms make to uh, keep other organisms from uh, uh, getting the best of them. And many of them have interactions with lipid structures, uh, and particularly some of the, the, the allergens which are cause more severe disease. And their actions interfere with, with common pathways that all organisms uh, possess. Uh, a, a few caveats here that I might mention, and that these allergens, uh, the groups that uh, sensitization by proxy might be pretty common. For example, you are, if you're in uh, Saudi Arabia and jump on a camel and all of a sudden start wheezing and sneezing, this could be because you're allergic to cows uh, or some other animal. And so you got sensitized to the cow, but you react to the, the camel. Uh, the same might be true with cats and dogs. Uh, the one caveat that's kind of important to remember is not every member of a family is allergenic. Uh, uh, and not all of them are cross-reactive, but many are. And this is because the structures vary uh, by small uh, amino acid differences. And if they're in critical areas in an epitope, then, then they won't cross-react as much. They won't bind as well to IgE. But what's really kind of interesting is that it's, it's, all these amino acid differences may not be so important as the similarity of the structure, the final structure. And we know that some amino acid uh, uh, differences are essentially uh, uh, very similar to each other. A hydrophobic amino acid for another hydrophobic amino acid or you know, this sort of thing. 
But what I want to suggest is it's actually the function of these allergens that's, that's really the important uh, thing. And so let's go over some of the functions. The major protein allergen groups are in the lipid transfer proteins. They're in storage proteins, which are uh, storage proteins are kind of multifunctional things. They they not only uh, are storage, but they, uh, for example, in peanut, the major allergen, it also inhibits uh, amylase, which insects need to get their sugar. Uh, it also inhibits uh, uh, proteases, which uh, fungi uh, sometimes secrete or usually secrete, and and if you can inhibit those, you won't be so susceptible to the fungi. Uh, plant pathogenesis related proteins seem to be a very important group of allergens. There's 14 of these are defined now and about five of these groups are, are very frequently uh, seen as uh, uh, sensitizing allergens. We've all heard about the profilins which are actually calcium binding and they're, very, they're actually kind of important in lipid uh, the signaling also. Uh, but they're, they're in every single plant. They're in every single organism on Earth, but the, the animal and the plant ones don't seem to cross-react at all. They have different structures. The lipocalins, uh, this is when you think animals, lipocalins are fatty acid uh, carrying molecules, which uh, uh, they carry steroids, they carry uh, a, a lot of these things. And fatty acid metabolism is, is kind of an important area. To, to think about because it has many effects on on our cellular uh, activation and 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 the activation of different pathways and we will describe a little bit of that. Pyrovalbumins are calcium binding proteins and many of these are allergens that, and they uh, they are essentially responsible for most of the fish and uh, uh, the fish allergies and and the related things related to that. Uh, I call them friends of fish, and uh, and that includes mites. Uh, but even more so, the tropomyosins, and we know that that is really the shellfish that gives us the shellfish allergy. But but again, the shellfish, uh, the tropomyosins uh, have many friends, and and that goes from shrimp, lobster, crab, and all this sort of thing to mites, to moths, to spiders. Uh, to cockroaches, and it's kind of interesting that tropomyosins, you know, they're muscle proteins and they're highly conserved, but mammalian uh, tropomyosins don't seem to be allergenic, and uh, that one of the reasons uh, proposed for this is they have a little different amino acid sequence, and they're not very stable. They get digested rather quickly. So some of these functions, the functions of these different uh, uh, molecules that, that are allergens uh, are, include hydrolases, the proteases and glycosidases. These are things that, that either bind proteins, digest them, or uh, bind sugars and digest them. The beta-1,3 gluconases, pectinases, and uh, these sort of things. And well, this is quite confusing in that protease and glycosidase inhibitors are also <coughs> And that's always been a confusing thing because we try to say, well, what is the property that, that, that actually gives these molecules their allergenicity? Well, proteases, okay, we can understand that from a number of, point of view, uh, points of view in that proteases uh, destroy barrier function. Uh, uh, many of them uh, modulate the immune system by, for example, destroying CD40, which pushes things towards a Th2 response. They uh, clip off CD23, which is the uh, low affinity receptor for IgE, which is a negative feedback and, uh, of uh, production of the E and this sort of thing. But how can protease inhibitors do the same thing? Um, the protease inhibitors, uh, the proteases are really involved in a lot of cellular processes. And, and uh, the second lecture we'll get into this a little bit more. But You've heard of the protease activated receptors, which is how a lot of hormones uh, signal cells and, and this sort of thing. And uh, if you interfere with these processes, which are major biological processes, then you're you could actually look at both of these as being a toxin. 
and that essentially what's going on is your immune system really reacts strongly, uh, particularly in the mucosa, to to these events that disrupt the homeostasis of, uh, of things that are normal processes. Uh, the lipid binding and transport molecules are really important, and, and I said, you know, there's there's a lot of things that go on with lipid signaling, which uh, we all recognize that the phosphatidyl in in this inositol uh, biphosphate, uh, which is uh, activated, uh, G protein uh, activate uh, the splitting of this by uh, uh, phospholipase C, and you make DAG, diacetylglycerol, and IP3. And inositol, uh, tri inis inositol uh, triphosphate actually uh, regulates your calcium uh, stores. It, uh, it releases calcium stores, which which have, has a lot of different uh, pleiotropic effects inside the cell. And of course, uh, diastylglyceride activates phosphokinases, which also have a lot of important functions. So you see, these are kind of important molecules in, uh, in, uh, in cellular functions. Uh, the same thing goes for calcium binding, uh, uh, parvalbumins, uh, and the polycalcins from plants. I didn't list those here, but uh, and most of these are again characterized by their stability to heat and, and uh, acid denaturation, ability to ligamize and uh, uh, dimerize, trimerize, etc. Uh, for some reason, I got a duplicate slide in here, but I want to make a couple points that that. Uh, a couple of these PR10, the pathogenesis-related proteins that are, that are definite allergens, are the nonspecific lipid transfer proteins. The PR10s, which is the BET V1, the, the Birch homolog, which is uh, uh, everyone's heard about the pan allergens from Birch. It, it's essentially a ribonuclease, okay, and it's in a lot of different organisms, particularly in plants. And this is how plants protect themselves from viruses. Um, anyway, yeah, I see those a lot in the IgE reports from component testing. Yeah, there are, and and, uh, and we'll, we'll get into precisely which ones are important and associated with which uh, sources in the second lecture. Uh, kind of interesting that the tropomyosins and profilin and this sort of thing are, are they kind of also involved in muscles and cellular motility. And if you interfere with cellular motility and the uh, polymerization of, uh, of, uh, of uh, actin, uh, you, you mess up a lot of functions. And so if uh, something you, or you're exposed to something that does that and you don't want it around, uh, then you probably make pretty vigorous immune responses against it. So what does this all mean? Well. Most, uh, most allergens are proteins that are broadly distributed among related and non-related sources. They're all over the place. And the cross-sensitization is very prevalent. Uh, allergic responses are expanded by bystander effects that we've talked about. So a lot of this IgE you see uh, may be against something that's probably not relevant to creating symptoms. It's just, uh, it's this bystander effect kind of messes us up, and so so when you measure a specific IgE with an allergen extract, either skin test or in vitro, uh, you know you're likely to be uh, um, you know, confounded by this stuff. But and and the basic thing is that allergens rec represent proteins that provide essential host functions and most likely induce inflammation by interrupting homeostasis uh, and. Uh, this has kind of led me to think that, that what we should be calling these is allergotoxins. But uh, uh, that's another story, and I'll be writing a paper on that here before long. Brock, we have enough trouble trying to explain allergens to patients. If we start calling toxins, we'd be in real big trouble. Well, uh, actually, the definition of a toxin is something that's biologically derived uh, that, that disrupts homeostasis. And so, uh, you know, so it, you know, it, that fits pretty well. But I understand your, uh, uh, when you say toxin, people reach a different level of uh, uh, 
a clarity or, or of attention because, you know, a toxin, oh my gosh, that's terrible. Oh, an allergen? Uh, that's not so bad. <laughs> you know, that sort of thing. Anyway, okay, what are some of the practicalities of these considerations? And uh, uh, things are kind of still up in the air, I guess. Um, here's some examples of some, some problems, uh, like the plant allergens. You know, what's, what's present in trees, grass, weeds, fruits, veggies, nuts, legumes, and latex? Propylens. They're in all of them. Okay? Now, does, do the, the ones in nuts and trees uh, and fruits are, are a little bit more cross-reactive than the ones from grass. But who's to say in, you know, one patient versus another and that sort of thing. But that's sort of the story. And we have the, we have the tree, nut, food cross-reactions uh, sometimes because of propylens. Now, since they're so common, and sensitization is so common to them, uh, do they really cause symptoms? And actually, uh, from a respiratory point of view, we, we think that, you know, there's a paper coming out in Jackie that they certainly do. They, they challenge people with propylens that are sensitized and they get respiratory problems. Again, another one is the, these nonspecific lipid transfer proteins. Uh, uh, they're in every single uh, one of these plants. And again, probably uh, they could all cross-react, but do they? And that's kind of where we're still up in the air. We know some of them do, and we know some don't. The PR10 proteins is a ribonuclease. The polycalcins are seem to be responsible in trees, grass, and weeds. These are calcium binding proteins, and they're probably in other ones. And even we know from latex is also present. You know, the latex tree, but also in uh, it's present in fruits and veggie and nuts and, and of course, latex. And that's, that's why we see the latex fruit syndrome. So we, these things cross-track. By the way, heaven is a, uh, uh, is a carbohydrate binding molecule. OK. Uh, there's over 170 propylens okay, in all these different things. So I just wanted to kind of point that out. That that if you're sensitized to that one, you're probably going to have a lot of positive tests. And you don't know what they mean. Uh, OK, I did mention that the parvalbumins uh, were fish and amphibians. Uh, and you know there's a lot of cross-reactivity to all the fish. Um, uh, tropomyosin, shrimp, parasites, insects, albumins from dog, cat, cows, pig. Uh, but but probably more important than the albumins are these lipocalins from dog, cat, horse, and even milk. Uh, uh, I think uh, beta lactoglobulin is a is a lipocalin. Ovomucoid from egg is a very important allergen. It's also one of these uh, inhibitors of uh, of protease and amylase and uh, and a lipid transfer uh, protein. Uh, or binds lipids anyway. Uh, and it, it seems to be much more important than the ovalbumin. And the reason is ovalbumin is denatured when you cook it. Um, IgA from cat and, and from birds seems to be kind of important, especially birds and bird fancier disease. That's more of an IgG thing. But it's certainly uh, uh, it's to their, their IgA that's in their defecate. Uh, caseins and alpha lactalbumin uh, from milk. The caseins are very easy to digest, so uh, it's a good source of protein because of that. Uh, and but there's there's three of them: uh, alpha, beta, and kappa. And the kappa one seems to be kind of important uh, in that when you digest it all the way down to its limit, you know, as small as you can get it, there's a peptide in there that's an opiate. And that actually slows down the gut. And so that means if you slow down the gut, what's ever in there, you're exposed to longer. So it, so it could have some influence on uh, uh, allergy from that point of view with everything else that you're taking in. Hmm. And we've heard about cross-reacting carbohydrate determinants uh, in insects, venoms, uh, many plants. And, and they cause positive tests. Um, there's uh, some. There's a lot of doubt whether they can actually cause symptoms, however. 
uh, that some people think they do and some people think they don't. Is that like that alpha gal that you read about? Yeah, alpha gal. But the most of them are a penel they're, they're attached to end link sugars, uh, which uh, has a fucose on it, and that seems to be the major determinant. And and um, you know that's that's really common in a lot of things, and including some blood groups. <laughs> so you know uh, that's uh, that, that that whole area is a little up in the air. But you can get positive tests. Uh, <coughs> you can get it from you can get a positive uh, uh, immuno cap to insects and uh, and all other things that that contain the, that cross-reacting carbohydrate determinant and, and probably uh, no symptoms in the patient. So how do we analyze this? And I'll go through this really quick because I think you're all sort of familiar with this. Uh, in that, that the, uh, uh, if you're doing the component analysis, you realize that the advantage here is that if you have a, a nut, a tree, and a fruit, uh, you can have a cross-reactive component. You'll have a positive test uh, if the patient is sensitive to these, but there might, there are probably, and there are specific allergen components uh, which uh, are only in the apple and only in the tree and only in the nut. And this is where the component analysis really helps us out in in trying to define these uh, differences. And I think you've seen this picture of the immunocap Isaac. And uh, essentially, it's, uh, it's pretty cool. Uh, you know, it's in, it's immunochip, and, and you can, with uh, 20 microliters of serum, you get 412 Ig antibody results. They're semi-quantitative, but uh, uh, you know, they're the pure proteins. And I I won't spend too much time on this one, but uh, and I think uh, later this month we have uh, two people that'll certainly go over this and uh, talk about some of their clinical experiences with, uh, with, with this modality. So um, these are the major groups of proteins, uh, it's no accident, that are on the component resolve diagnosis uh, tests and obviously the proflins and they're associated with symptoms like I said the cross-reacting carbohydrate determinants, which are seldomly associated with symptoms, PR10 proteins, which uh, seem to be, uh, uh, you know, fairly widespread in all these fruits and vegetables, but they're they're uh, they're heat and digestion labile, and therefore they're, they're we believe they're responsible for a lot of the symptoms and oral allergy, uh, because as soon as you swallow them, they're digested and they're gone. Uh, and so if someone thinks they're allergic to a fruit because they makes their mouth itch, they <coughs> could be allergic to a protein. The lipid transfer proteins, on the other hand, are very heat stable and they're strongly associated with systemic reactions to fruits and, and vegetables and nuts. Um, but, uh, and so uh, they're represented on this test. Storage proteins, peanut, soy, uh, of course other nuts. Uh, are also on these tests parvalbumins for the fish, tropomyosins for the shellfish and crustaceans, uh, and lipocalins and albumins are on, on, on these tests. So, kind of summarizing some of this, uh, we've characterized many allergens. You know, it's it's upward, of, you know, it's over a thousand. Uh, and and we're, we're now defining these things are relevant uh, to symptoms. And also, we're finding out, you know, what, what is the relationship uh, between different sources? Um, what's the relationship between a, uh, a mold allergen and milk, for example? Or, you know, there's, there's uh, uh, peanut, peanut allergens, um, there's a, a PR10 protein that's in RNAs in peanuts. Is that related to uh, uh, to the other PR10 proteins? And uh, uh, the whole upshot of this will be the components are going to be a great aid in diagnosis. And I think actually it'll probably uh, lead us to much better treatments and understanding, obviously understanding, but better treatments in that 
probably in the future we will treat with one of these classes of proteins along with some sort of immunomodulator and uh, and actually be able to uh, uh, induce Tregs or whatever and suppress allergies. If you kind of look at this, what we're doing today, um, and injecting allergen extracts, which we really don't know a whole lot about, and there's chances that these allergen extracts have a lot of cross-reactivity, different ones cross-react with others, then, then uh, obviously there's room for improvement. So the coming attractions, and uh, the next one is going to be a lot more specific on these allergen families and their, their mechanism of action and how they impact the IgE system, and, and we'll talk about the clinical issues. So I'll kind of leave you there. Uh, well, I, I'll show this one slide here. That this is uh, Prue A1 and Bet B1, uh, which actually uh, shows why they cross-react. Prue A1 is from cherry, sweet cherry, and you see uh, one of these in the green, one of these uh, is folded in the in the brown, and they're really identical to each other, and. Actually, this what this is structure right here is called a P loop, and and a lot of times the epitopes are on these these uh, little outlying uh, uh, parts of the protein, and you can see they both have it. They, they're very similar, and and you would certainly predict from almost any database on their amino acid sequence or their their structure that they would cross react highly, and they do. So that's where we're going with all this stuff. So I, I'll kind of use up most of my time here and uh, kind of open it to any questions and see if we can uh, get some discussion on this. Well, very interesting. Thanks, Bob. I'm going to mm -hmm. take back over the uh, presenter role so that you can see us. Can you see us all sitting here? Uh, there you go. OK, gotcha. Yeah. Wow, fascinating. Um, I'm going to ask the first question. I, I know that uh, I, I recently had a patient who uh, was severely allergic to seafood, tropomycin, type you know, shrimp and lobster, and the allergist wanted to treat that by desensitizing to dust mite that the patient was only slightly allergic to because of the theory that the tropomycin and dust mite would cross-react with the seafood, and therefore by treating with dust mite you could potentially reduce seafood allergy. Do, do you think we're going to eventually get to the point where that type of approach might be practical? Well, uh, I, I think that approach, I mean, treating for seafood with, with dust mites is kind of a sticky wicket because it's Duraf-10 is tropomyosin in, the, in, the, uh, in mites. And it's, um, how much is there? I mean, how much is there in the dust mite extract? You know, that sort of thing. Uh -huh. So we will we will we have recombinant purified tropomyosin from from uh, shellfish, and uh, Lair's done a lot of work with this, and that's what we'll we'll be treating with. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think, uh, uh, in fact, these what six seven families of proteins, with a few exceptions, is what we're going to be treating with. Uh, it'll be a little more dangerous, uh, I think. Uh, from the experiences a long time ago in England, where they, they were uh, skin testing people with purified grass group one allergens, which is an expansion for you know, if that makes any difference. Uh, they anaphylaxed and killed a couple people. Wow. Treating them with their you know skin testing with purified allergens, so that banned all immunotherapy in England for I don't know ten years or something like that. Yeah, we don't want to do that. But I guess, yeah. I guess my point is, right now we test for ragweed and and tree pollen and grass pollen and so on. And in the future, we may be testing for epitopes, you know, specific protein exactly. families. We can, we can even predict. You can actually predict uh, from a new product, uh, or you can you can synthesize your own sequence uh, and, and make your own protein, you can predict whether it's allergenic or not. Wow. And a lot of that's going on with these databases if uh, they're looking at uh, different foods and trying to predict allergenicity. So it, it's, you know, it's fairly well advanced. But I think, uh, I think it's really going to change the way we look at allergy and, and how we treat it. And this is really welcome. I mean, this is going to give allergy a real boost, I think, yeah. because it's 
it's technology. It's about it's technology time. The allergists are going to have, and and uh, yeah, I mean it, it just uh, and it also answers a whole lot of our questions. Paul, you always have questions about uh, positive or, or negative positive symptoms, negative tests, or vice versa. And I, now we kind of know why all that stuff happens. You know, uh, it's uh, I you know it's kind of rewarding. We've been making these arguments about skin testing and in vitro for years and now we're finally starting to understand that we we're both probably right and that then we know why. So that's that's kind of fun for me. Do you have a question, Paul? Well, I have sort of an observation when you were talking, Brock, it made me think. Um, I do a, um, a combined eosinophil esophagitis clinical with one of the GI doctors here mm -hmm. um, and I don't know how much you know about eosinophil esophagitis. I don't know how yeah. much anybody really knows about eosinophil um, but it's interesting. More. <laughs> oh, 15 or more for field, or what is it? No. Well, I'm about EOS. EOS. Oh, 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 yeah, 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 yeah. And you're talking about EOS. I didn't hear the first part of that. Um, okay. You know, where they have elevated eosinophils in their esophagus, and they have, you know, right. they have problems swallowing, et cetera. Um, um, but the, um, the interesting thing is that um, I, when you start talking about all these components, you start wondering, is there, is, since nobody really knows what the mechanism is, is there are there some components in these patients that are causing these symptoms that these patients are have problems with, not so much individual foods per se. Um, we mm -hmm. the, the interesting thing is some of these patients will report um, seasonal allergy symptoms, and there are some um, there have been some um, case reports of individuals who when their when their um, seasonal allergies um, increase, they have increased numbers of eosinophils on their on their biopsies, mm -hmm. and it only occurs, the, spe the spike only occurs, or occurs more um, during pollen seasons when they have problems. Uh, other people, that's not an issue, um, but the, um, but nobody really knows if, how much of this is an IgE sort of reaction to food, how much is more of a type 4 um, um, T cell reaction to foods. We do patch testing to foods. A lot of the foods that um, get patched with um, um, are things that may have similar may have similar components like the grains um, that people have. These are also things you know it's been associated with foods because if you take people off foods and put them on an al muscle diet, their their eosinophil counts will drop and their 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 biopsies will will go pretty much to normal if you take them off for 12 weeks. So there's some relationship to food, but what that relationship is nobody knows. And the interesting thing is that there could be. In some of these patients, maybe component analysis might give us a better idea of what's what's the culprit here. Yeah, you mentioned this the other day in the seminar a little bit, and and I had a, a direct thought. There are some some of these proteins actually can induce uh, uh, eosin, and and so uh, I can't remember. I was trying to remember which one, but I think that's very likely, and and I think uh, it's certainly worth pursuing. So I you know. I'm, and when we get into mechanisms, what do these things do, you know, when they get in our mucosa and stuff like that? Uh, they're, they're, you know, this toxin sort of thing, but, but they actually, they're, your cells recognize danger signals, intracellular. And so there's a whole new immune system inside the cells that can actually trigger a lot of these different responses. And they're called NRL. Uh, uh, proteins and and the cell kind of makes a decision whether to kill itself or fight and and these things uh, uh, and this is how we protect ourselves and there's some of these proteins do really specific things to uh, 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 to our inflammatory system and very well could induce uh, um, eosinophilia or, or all sorts of different responses so I think it's really worth looking for looking at well, I look forward to your next presentation and also to sitting down and trying to learn all of these new things because it's very complicated, but out of complexity eventually I'm pretty sure will come simplicity. I would like to remind everybody that coming up in the future, not too far from now, on June 13th, which is uh, another Monday, uh, or it's, it's an, on a, a week from next Monday, uh, Dr. Williams will be giving uh, part two of the molecular biology of allergenic proteins uh, after that, 
Um, we're going to hear from Matthew Greenhot on June 20th. Uh, he's going to be talking about components and uh, you, their use in diagnostic testing for food allergy. Uh, he's an assistant professor at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. And then finally, James Thompson is going to talk with us on June 24th, which is a Friday on component testing for aeroallergen sensitivity. So clearly, this is the month of component testing and molecular biology of allergens and IgE measurements. So um, this is a series that I would strongly recommend everybody consider uh, joining us for. If you're watching us uh, online after the fact, uh, these will all be posted and uh, you'll be able to find them under the appropriate dates. Uh, at any rate, we're going to stop here. This uh, it's, it's noon in Kansas City. Everybody wants to go to uh, next conference. I'd like to thank Dr. Williams for this, uh, this interesting presentation and uh, uh, join us next time. We have a great weekend, everyone, and we'll, we'll see you next time. Thanks, Brock. Okay. You're certainly welcome, Jay. My pleasure. Thanks, Brock. Yeah. Bye. Bye. This has been an ACAAI production. To learn more about conferences on line allergy or the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, go to www.acaai.org. See you next time.